What up, world? It's Thursday at noon. It's Ergo Radio. I am Damon. And I'm Kiss. Nice to be back up here. What we do here is showcase the folks celebrating the culture of our city for the more equitable and the more creative. We got off on a very, uh, it, it was a real like synchronized head nod up here. Yeah, no, nah, we're getting Eagles. it in. <laughs> how, you, how you feeling, Damon? Man, I'm feeling all right. I'm, uh, I'm up here just figuring out how to cope with existing, man. How's that going? I'm doing it. I'm doing better at it. <laughs> So <laughs> I'm upright. <laughs> how about you, man? You decent? I'm doing all right. I've, I figured that out a while back. I'm now. I'm just trying to figure out how to uh, how to get paid for it. Okay, where you uh you closed just you had the the, the chest open a little bit more mm. when I saw you, and then you closed it back up. So this is an important point <laughs> for for those of y'all out here. So I'm wearing it's one of my favorite shirts. It's a Yankees 1999 World Champion shirt, but the buttons are misaligned so it goes at a diagonal uh-huh. and i don't know why or how that happened you were feeling sexy about it for a second there's no other way around it yeah, i was feeling <laughs> a little sexy about it but i figured we might as well get professional up here <laughs> speaking of professional uh, a couple community announcements real quick uh tomorrow uh, as part of this lunch break event series at jbtv music television that's 318 west grand folks over these days are doing a little uh live stream concert featuring rick wilson so that's noon to three tomorrow in the middle of the day. If you're trying to avoid your job, that seems like a good place to be. And then tomorrow night, I'll be spending for the second half of it, but we have the next edition of the Breathing Room series. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this month, August, Free the People. Uh, we've been a part of this Envision and Justice uh, Arts and Humanities initiative throughout the city that's addressing incarceration. So our monthly Breathing Room event series is going to be highlighting that work in alignment with the Black August tradition. So for those who don't know, there's a prison strike happening all over the country. uh, And we as abolitionists have been in alignment with the tradition of Black August, where we uplift political prisoners, talk about the Black radical tradition and, you know, raise consciousness together. So we're going to have Monty Jordan performing. We're going to have some teach-ins, free Reiki. We're going to be finishing up our mural on 51st right off bishop amazing yeah it's getting real dope so come to breathing room on friday and then also on saturday thought poet and naji are having um i think i think it's called mindful i forgot the name of the the event but saturday there's gonna be a a a dope uh photo exhibit happening at the space starting at seven and then also going back to friday the next edition of the all smile series curated by ergo lumridge jones is happening at Tonic Room. I can't remember who's on exactly, but there are a couple of folks we'd have up here, and that's always a good time. It's a pretty cheap ticket and a, a good night to hear music in the city. That's all. That's all I got. Oh, follow us uh, and subscribe to us and all that, uh, and write us a review. It's very helpful if you write reviews, but only if you like us. Yeah, if you don't like us, go sit down somewhere. Yeah, you want to you go? Ahead? Man, I'm very excited. We got a. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and throw it out there. We we got a we got a legend. Of Whoa. the Chicago cultural wow. scene in the in the building, we got curator, DJ, fashion designer, space maker, the one and only Vic Lloyd is here. Everybody makes some noise wherever you're at. Bra, bra, bra. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Is, that introduction was very, very kind. Oh man, man. Kind. we it is kind for you to be here. This is much love. Very few people have gotten legend up here. I'm trying to think. Your dad might have gotten a My legend. My dad might have got a legend. Um, I don't know. I had to have been aware of you in high school. Okay. In order to be a legend. Yeah. Okay. yeah like if, if you were doing your thing already when I was in high school. And you're still doing your thing to the point that we're having you up here. Yeah. Then, then you qualify. Not necessarily. There were people who were whack when I was in high school who are still <laughs> being whack, who are not legends. <laughs> okay. But but you are not in that category. Okay, Thank you very much for coming up here. Thank I, you for I, having I, me. Like I said, my like uh junior high school me is feeling super cool right now uh <laughs> well, hopefully but, the adult you are feeling cool i'm cool too. as well i'm feeling cool as well okay, but good. but uh but when high school you listen to the podcast he's gonna yeah, be oh, yeah 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 he's, okay. he's gonna be feeling this but we always like to start the show with a two-part question yes so answer it as you as you feel in this season in this time defined time however so it could be season year today okay. this hour this lifetime uh how is the world treating you and how are you treating the world uh, the world's treating me amazing. I feel like um, everything that I'm doing is, you know, getting, you know, properly nurtured. And I feel like I've always treated, you know, the my surroundings very, very well. You know, 
I love to treat people how they treat me. You know what I'm saying? I'm not a big person on, I'm not an entitled person, which a lot of people probably would feel like, you know, a person been around doing their thing. They feel entitled. I feel like I still have to work for everything I get, mm. you know? So I, I expect that from other people too. Yeah. You know, I always want to be a person that is pushing things forward, not holding things back. So something I've been thinking about a lot recently with that is that, yeah, the people who do things well never stop thinking that they have to work for it. Mm-hmm. I think, and it, but it's not an entitled thing to think that the work should be seen more the more you do it, right? So there's a difference between like expecting things to be done for you or that right. you don't have to put the labor in. But when you've been doing things at a certain level for a certain amount of time, maybe the expectation is, hey, if I make a thing, it should be seen more or my labor should be seen more. So like, does that ring true to you? Um, I agree with that. I feel as a person who has you know, done a lot for other people. I feel like that goes underappreciated at times, mm-hmm. but I just think that that's the way the world works now. It's a very, very now society. Like everything is in the now, you know, I think we need to get better. Even myself getting better at paying uh, like homage to people that came before you. Um, I just think that that's just a thing that we should do. It's like our history. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Our history gets forgotten if we don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. So you know. We've all seen Coco. We all agree. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? I feel like, yeah. So it's like kind of like the Coco thing. It's like, you know, nobody's going to know, you know, you were involved in this if people don't continue to talk about it. And I feel like, you know, we, all of our legacies deserve to be like, des- deserve to stay alive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let, let's start there then. Cause, cause we love kind of like drawing out lineages. And, mm-hmm. and so you talk about paying homage to those who came before you in the way that you operate or work in the world, are there people whose lineage you see yourself continuing or are there people that you, you give praise yeah, to? Yeah, like, you know what I'm saying? So when I, uh, when I was in the music field, I had like two amazing mentors, Filthy Rich and Jam, that uh, like was our managers and kind of showed us the right things to do like on the music side, which still holds true to how I do business mm-hmm. and other things. Right. Then on the fashion side, I, you know, had Corey from Leaders. You know, I had Diego had a bunch of guys like uh, Larry Mondragon, like people that I just kind of talked to and got advice from, you know, whether it's like, you know, I can sit here and name people forever, yeah. whether they be from Chicago or other places, but those are just kind of people that like kind of framework of like who I am as far as in the industries that I'm involved in. Yeah. So like, are there people who you didn't know personally who are maybe like two to three generations before, like historically you see yourself in lineage of? Well, I, I personally try not to do that. Like, you know, you can respect somebody, but I try to draw my things from people that I actually spoke to and touched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, a lot of people is like, oh, man, such and such was a great mentor to me, although I never met them. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm inspired by right. what such and such it is. Like, I'm super inspired by Jay-Z as a businessman. Mm-hmm. But it's like, I'm not going to be like, oh, man, Jay-Z made me who I am. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I saw Jay-Z once. We waved hello. Like, you know what I'm saying? He like, you know. He waved back? Yes. I think that counts as mentorship, according yeah. to some. That, okay. That, that's, yeah. He, he's known but, to not wave back at yeah. Vidi. <laughs> he's a, he's yeah. an infamous non-wave backer. I was in the Rock Nation office, so Word. he kind of, you know, he, he figured he's somebody around here. here. So, you know, yeah. Did, so. did a little, like, Queen Royal wave, little side yeah. move. Then he went in his office, and I didn't see him again that day. So, <laughs> yeah. But, no, nah, I tend to, you know, take people that actually had taken the time out of their lives to give me some guidance. And also show me, you know, the right way. And then some, some people teach you by the wrong way that they do certain mm-hmm. things, but you know, maybe, you know, it's a learning process on both sides. Mm-hmm. I, I feel. So to give a little bit of a, a context to like our show and how we got started, we kind of were responding to like two phenomena, like the overlap of like the political movements that, that have been happening, mm-hmm. especially like driven by young people and how that connected with like the, the cultural renaissance that's been happening in Chicago mm-hmm. for about like the last decade yeah. or so now. And it's exciting to have you up here because I think you're a great firsthand source on like the hip hop driven Chicago independent facing renaissance. So we excited to get into the backstory, but before, because we can maybe get lost in some of that, right. like, yeah, yeah, let's yeah, talk yeah. about right now the okay. things you got coming up and what's exciting you, because if we get into right the story, now. we might, yeah, we okay. might leave well, some of that off. So right what's now, coming up? like DJing is going amazing. So, uh, August 31st, I'll be on North Coast. Where? Um, I think my set said 6.45 mm-hmm. for like an hour. Then I'm doing an after show. It's unofficial. 
at uh, Emporium in Wicker Park. We got some good local. It's official now, though. We made it's not an official North Coast, but it is just. It's it, official. It is official. It's yeah. official. It's the official <laughs> thing that you'll be doing Friday exactly. after North Coast, or even if you didn't go to North yeah. Coast. We got a lot of good young talent: Sterling, Reese, um, Nick Jr. I'm DJing. Esquire's DJing. Just One's DJing. Mike Hundreds is hosting. Be dropping some exclusive merch mm-hmm. for the after show. I have some cool cocktails named after some of the artists. So it'll be a foot time and it's free. So oh, go to no. do three, one, two search Vicar park fest, not Wicker park, Vicar park fest like and that. RSVP is free 99. Come through and kick it with me. it will be good. Um, but then it's just plenty of things. So this weekend, like right now, um, we're doing a skate night with the tigers, Stan mansion in Logan square. That's six to 1130. Um, you can go to 1833.fm.com thingy yeah. for the tickets. Um, that's fun. Saturday, I'm at Deadbolt and Logan. That's free. Sunday, I'm at the Logan Square Food Truck Festival, like in the middle of the day. Are you a Google Calendar aficionado? Because I feel like you're in many places and many times and you're doing like whether you're DJing and all of them or not, you're you're kind of putting it together. How are you? This is a very maybe externally not interesting question, but as someone who does many things also, are you like officially on a Google calendar that has everything? How are you keeping track of all this stuff? What's crazy is I keep most stuff in my head. Mm. Oh, that is a, a rare, talk about treating the world. That is a rare breed right there. Yeah. It all what I there. try to do if I have a busy week, like a week like this is mm-hmm. I'll sit down one of the days I'm at the crib. I got like a dry erase board. I just write down what I'm doing every day just so I'll see it, mm-hmm. and know it. Yeah. But like stuff like this, I put this, you know, my publicist made sure this was on my calendar. Shout out right. to the publicist. Shout out. Yeah. So even even beyond work, I want to stay in that of like Sorry. managing just like interacting with the world and the pay. So there are a few people, and I think you are included in this, of like, if I'm going out to a certain spot, I'm probably gonna see their face, which like is letting me know, like, wow, they do way more shit than I do. Like, <laughs> like I struggle just getting out the house. Right. It's just like hanging out and being social and showing up to things. How do you manage to keep the energy to like just make all the moves that requires you to like stay plugged in everything that's going well, I'm on. I'm a person that requires very little rest. Okay. I probably like, so if I DJ somewhere and I'm out to three thirty four in the morning, I get home, go to sleep. I'm still up by seven thirty eight. I don't require a lot of sleep and the energy of the scene kind of drives me. That just hurt me in my yeah, heart yeah. though. <laughs> as a, as someone who, I don't know if I require it, but I prefer it. <laughs> you don't, do you get the like overtired thing with you sleep like seven, eight hours? No, if I sleep seven to eight hours, it just doesn't happen. Like I don't, it doesn't just like I wake it up. happened once in 1996. And <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. It's like, it doesn't really matter to me. Like sleeping is like, oh man, it's cool. I enjoy it. But it's like, man, I'm like so anxious while I'm asleep about what I can be doing when I get up. So it's just kind of like that kind of things and now i just learned from being in this industry that you have to show face like the internet has eliminated some of that but i like the personal connection i like to be able to go to places and see people and people like oh man vic came out mm-hmm. that's cool like you know i thought he would be over this you know i like to support people i like to support people that are coming up you know what i'm saying because support isn't necessary like i tell people all the time like supporting me doesn't mean you have to come to my store and buy a t-shirt support is sometimes you just like Oh man, I'm gonna go by and check on the guys and see how they're doing. Check the space out. Maybe just, you know, Instagram that you came by. That's support. That's like showing that you're like intrigued by what is going on. And it means so much more than a retweet. That so means much, even if yeah. you don't buy shit, that means so much more. Than yeah, because it's like cool. Like I know you're paying attention to what I'm doing. I know you're liking my posts. That's cool. It's tight. Yeah. But come by, just check it out. Yeah. You know, come by, tell me what you think. Like, you know, good or bad. Like, you know what I'm saying? I can take constructive criticism. You know, I what's, just what's the last piece of really good constructive criticism you got? Dang, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I think that it really came to why I'm probably very, very busy as a DJ is construction criticism I got is somebody is like, you're very, very good at DJing, but nobody knows. Cause you really just kind of do your thing and keep it moving. Mm-hmm. So I just actively pursued DJing more like getting out there and just doing stuff and it just like snowballed into a thing where like I'm way more busy than I thought I would be at this like you know when did you say when would you say that that really took off for you the DJing side two years something like that like when did that really like explode that now that's a thing you're doing weekly 
I don't know because it's like I've had waves of being very, very popular. I've been doing it like as a thing for like 16 years. Mm. So like when I first started doing it, it was a thing because I, I threw more parties. So it was like kind of like I was DJing a lot. So because I'm throwing a party. Right. But then it like got to a thing, a point where a lot of other people were booking me. But then it got to a point like I got disinterested in working with other people. Mm. So like I would only DJ stuff that we were doing, which might have been like once a week. And that was cool. But then, like, the corporate stuff started taking off, and then people just started hitting me, and then, like, concerts come open up. Oh, man, travel here. We want you to do this. And mm -hmm. just kind of snowballed into a thing. And, and, you know, a lot of people are putting me in positions to win, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. I, I think, like, there, there's something to be said for that continuity, of, right? Like, cause, so in those times where you weren't doing it a ton, let's say you got disinterested in the working with other people, was it still something that, you were building your craft on behind the scenes, like, or did you put the the decks away for? No, 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 never. I was always doing it mm -hmm. because even when I'm saying, "Oh man, I wasn't doing it that much," I was still DJing like six times a month. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't like I was like, "Oh man, I'm DJing one time a month." I'm mean, just I wasn't engaged in it fully. Yeah. Like, let me do it because like now, I might be, be DJing three to four times a week now. And like, you know, I really, I never even thought I would DJ that much because I didn't want to DJ yeah. that much, like out. Cause I didn't want to be out that much, but yeah. now it's fun. Everything I'm doing is like pretty cool. So, so I'm excited about it. Let's go back to the endurance piece that we were talking mm -hmm. about though. You know, it's one thing to do three times a week for a year, two years and feel like you've done some, you know, I said it's 150 episodes. That feels like a lot to us, but to, to kind of have the continuity to do that, you know, now across over a decade and, and just be someone who is out are there things that have emerged recently that are exciting about that to you? Like about kind of a new role or, or what, why continue doing it when it's so much more comfortable to be in your house? <laughs> I can sure do it because I'm, I'm a workaholic in the sense is it's like, you know, I want to be doing something. Mm -hmm. I want to like, I need to be doing something, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? But I take my off time as my off time. Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But I'm at the store four to five days a week, you know, I'm DJing, some of those same nights. So some days I'm out my house at 10 a.m. and I'm not back in the house to 3 a.m. Yeah. And that really doesn't, you know, I'm used to it. It doesn't bother me. That's bedtime. That's your that's your bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of things are exciting to me. Like it's like, you know, new places. And it's like also as I grow, I try to create new niches for myself. Mm -hmm. So the thing that I'm working on now is I do a lot of corporate things, but now I'm trying to brand myself as doing things with like restaurants attached mm -hmm. to food, mm -hmm. a little bit more chill environments yeah. so I can DJ things that aren't necessarily a party all the time. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And keep, you know, keep it interesting and kind of be able to reach a new crowd. What do you mean by the corporate thing? What kind like of corporate gig, things? What kind so of like, that? I did something with Spotify, mm -hmm. did something with Nike. But these are parties you're talking about mainly? Like more so like parties are just like, so the thing with Spotify was with Wiz Khalifa. He did a cookout. Mm -hmm. Um, at uh, Ludlow Liquors, where they had me DJ, and then his his DJ played his album, and he played for, he played pool with his fans. That's a much easier set, just having to play the album. <laughs> his DJ, yeah, yeah his yeah, DJ yeah, got yeah, to play yeah, the yeah. album. I I was DJing <laughs> other stuff. Yeah. Are there gigs that you wouldn't have taken at the beginning that you still won't take now? Well, the thing is, I don't do weddings. I did one wedding. Oh, it's tell me. us about this wedding. <laughs> because it was a favor. It was mm -hmm. when I was at Leaders, it was um our Adidas rep at the time was getting married. And I told him if he ever got married, when he got married, I would DJ his You wedding. just didn't think he would ever get married? <laughs> no, I, he, I knew he was getting married. I was just thought that he might just be like, forget it by yeah. the time. Mm -hmm. But it was cool. I had a really, really nice time. I just don't like to get told what to play. Yeah. Yeah. I just kind of like to play. But with weddings, that's one that's of those things you kind of got to. You kind of got to do. It was a nice wedding, you know. That's a that is a tough world of, because it's technically showbiz. Like that's yeah. that is the entertainment industry, but that is a yeah that is a dark yeah. dark world. That, that and bar misses. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like a thing that I I would definitely like. You know what I'm saying? We have to be like really really good friends, and you have to be like you really really want me to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, is there a type of gig that you would have taken when you started out that now you still get offered, but you say no to? Well, I don't really work with a lot of promoters. That's really not my lane. I don't mm -hmm. like to get booked by promoters. Um, why, why not? Uh, Because I can do that same thing by myself. Like, right. you know what I'm saying? I can go to a venue and maybe not have as many people, but I can have a good room full of people make the same money and it'd be my thing. And not have to deal with all the BS. Well, I don't have to attach my brand to somebody else's that I don't want to mm -hmm. attach it to. 
man, when I used to work up at the promontory, we would have the, and the, you know, that's not like crazy BS, but you'd have these promoter nights and the, the kinds of questions and just stuff that you got run through. I, I, God, it was such a, yeah, that is, I've never, that is an industry that has more people who are bad at their jobs in ways that it shows than almost mm-hmm. any other industry I've ever encountered. Yeah. So I, I'd work with a concert promoter. You know, I work with certain party promoters. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. they hit me and it's like, it's not no big thing. A lot of times it's really about scheduling. Like, you know what I'm saying? They hit me and it's usually a day I know I don't do nothing. You know, I might do it, but I really, it's not like I don't have no problem with them. I just think it's guys, it's other DJs that make their living yeah. in that lane. And I just like, I would prefer them to get that money than me. Where I don't want to take nothing yeah. from yeah. Like, Nah, I feel that. Cause it's, you know, if done right, it's curating, but. At, at the the other end is just middleman and it gets it gets kind of peppish, yeah. you know, in, yeah. in a lot of ways. But but yeah, let's let's take a step back because yes. you know I, I think what excites me about having you up here is you know you and your team with you know Joe and, and Rello, you know, from Fat Tiger to, yes. to, to to leaders to to the, throughout the years have been central, I think, mm-hmm. participants and in the relationships of the Chicago cultural scene. So I, I, I want to know and want the people to hear you like your entry point into into that and then as we go through the story get your perspective of like what is unique about how chicago moves and operates and how our, our culture has developed okay so what what was really you know your first step into into participating you know i, I know it was the music but but how did that go and how did that end well yeah up well basically the, i just fast do that very very fast and so i ended not not really ended my rap career i kind of took a hiatus from a rap career an indefinite hiatus <laughs> yeah that's a that's a big rap group indefinite hiatus, hiatus yeah <laughs> so uh and, and, and like wanted to focus on other creative things and that creative thing became working with a clothing store that clothing store was leaders um at that clothing store i just started learning a lot of things so i started learning the buying side of the business so going to trade shows buying brands but also the marketing side of the business like how to get people entered into these new brands, like starting to appreciate these new brands, starting to buy them, starting them to become fans of these new brands. So that's really my whole start into everything to now is it was just having a need to want to introduce people to new things. And that became a thing that allowed me to start creating a brand at leaders. So turning leaders from just a story into a brand. Um, the entry point of that was just kind of just using the store that was a tool to know that people already were going to come here anyway because of other things that we got, but introducing them to like a style that we created. And so that became how the leaders brand happened. Were you someone who hung around the store before you even started working there? Yeah. Like, so that's how I started is like, I just like start being there and going up there on Saturdays, Mm -hmm. just hang out kind of, you know, treating it like the barbershop kind of hang out. Then another group of guys would started coming, hanging out and it just kind of became like a thing. You know, every week to the point it's like, oh man, the store was closed on. So how I started working at Leaders is the closed store was closed on Sunday. Me and Mike basically told Corey, we'll open it up on Sunday. Like you know, what I'm saying we're running on Sunday. We'll have people, you know, just to have another day open, and that just turned into eventually just being like, oh yeah, you guys should work here. You, oh mm-hmm. man, think you got a good eye? You should buy for the store. It's like, oh, man, we should try to start designing some stuff for the store. Let's figure that out. Mm-hmm. It just kind of snowballed into like a much bigger thing. You, you were saying before that like the entry point was you were willing to, whether it's opening up, <clears throat> excuse me, whether it's opening up on Sundays or just doing the work that needs to be done to keep things moving. You seem like someone who's not afraid to do the, you know, the, the grimy work, the not the not glamorous work. How, well, do you th- how do you think about paying dues? Like, is that a concept you... Well, yeah, there was an interesting thing on Twitter. A lot of people talking about like non-paid internships and mm-hmm. stuff like that. People feeling very, very entitled. And I think that that's the difference now than from if you go back 15, 16 years ago is there was no... There was an internet, but the internet wasn't what it is now. Mm-hmm. So there was a, there was no scope to be like, oh man, I'm super entitled. And I have these other people with a bunch of unrealistic goals telling me how I should do my thing. The only thing I knew how to do was if you want something, you go work for it. Mm -hmm. So I want something. I'm not working for it because I'm about to get this money right now. I'm working for it because I know the opportunity this is going to create down the line. And I feel like that's what a lot of people don't look at nowadays. Well, some of it is also the people that you have that opportunities with that opportunity with might have more money now than they did. Like things have been built to the point Mm -hmm. that things are industrialized and people make money. So it's one thing 
to work for free for someone who is just trying to figure out how to keep the lights on. Right. But it's another thing to work for free for someone you're like, I know you're making cash right now. Like I know you're Okay, so now this is that now now this is the thing. You know somebody's making cash, but rule number one, biggest rule I ever tell some especially, you never count nobody else's money. That's not your business. Mm -hmm. Your business is what are you going to get out of the situation regardless. So if this is a situation you feel like can put you in a better situation, you do it. Now, if you're just trying to look for a job, there's a lot of places hiring that you can go work and you can get paid. Mm -hmm. But if you're like, oh, man, I want to go work with Vic, but I want to make $100,000 a year. I'm not going to pay you $100,000 <laughs> a year. But I'm quite sure the job that you can get, not going to pay you $100,000 a year. But that's the thing of people trying to like count what you're doing, mm -hmm. count your money, kind of count what you have going on. And people really have no idea. They just want to be like, they want to be involved. I can put you in some positions to do the things that you want to do, but don't worry about what I'm doing. Worry about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Especially if you come to me asking me to do something like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. What kind of, what's the, I mean, I, I, bet that you get crazy asks or like unrealistic asks from people who you don't really know. Cause I know you have like your crew of people who you've been doing things with for a long time. Well, right now, one of my things is, is in my DMS right now on Instagram, I have probably 10 to 12 photographers that I don't know. Ask me, do I need them to shoot me for North coast? Mm. And my whole thing is I don't want to be rude, but I know photographers. If I'm going to have anybody come to North Coast with me, it's going to be a photographer that I know. Yeah. It's not going to be like somebody that random that found, saw my name on the flyer for it and be like, okay, I'm going to look this person up and I'm going to ask, can I shoot? Just so you can go to the show for free and probably not even shoot me. <laughs> probably just get in and go do your own thing mm -hmm. and shoot who you want to shoot because you feel like that's going to give you some clout. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of people just try to, they, a lot of people just want to be around. Yeah. Like, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Just because you got certain things working. That's a key. I think that's a key. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. We, we talk a lot about like cool kid syndrome up here. And then that's the key of like trying to be in the room. That's the most important part. It's not what yes. you're contributing to the room. It's do you have access to the room? Right. Um, how do you think about your contribution, whether it's to like the spaces you work in or just like this community as a whole before we go? back and do the history where do how do you see yourself fitting into this community what do you well, i say it's, it's the reason I, I named my brand what i named it like big homie sensei is because i feel like you know i'm gonna see say i have all the answers but i'm smart enough that i don't have them all but the ones that i do have i'm willing to share them mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying and i'm willing to give people a way to not step in the same pits that i stepped in along my way and to also be a person that can help you with something and not expect anything. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? I don't help you because I want you to do something for me. I help you because I don't mind helping, yeah. you know? So I, I think that that's, that's where I feel where I fit is I feel like I'm a, a, a connector, mm -hmm. but also like, you know, a consigliere, if you say mm -hmm. like somebody that you can talk to about the tough things that maybe you don't want to talk to nobody else about you know, to get the advice on like where you should take your career or yeah. if there's something you should do or, oh man, this company kind of hit me up. They want me to do this. What are some other ways that I can yeah. get involved or what's something that I can say to them to kind of get a little bit more of what I want? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's really, it's an important role. Yeah. yeah. So, so in that role, uh, how do you tell the, the story uh, of the whole picture of, uh, or the context of the scene? Right. Because, you know, I, I trace a lot of the origins of like where we are now as a city to like the cool kids era, the, the early treated crew, save yeah. money development. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, so that's about like, we're going eight to 10 years, yeah. maybe even a little bit further back. Yeah. And so, you know, I think you named the, the internet as a, you know, obviously the, the biggest shift, like how the blog with the store and like dropping a hat every other week exactly. was, like, was like an event. How do you process kind of where we are now in this like post well we're not post digital well, it's like, like okay hyper digital age so like you know if we go eight ten years back and we just look at uh like just the the leader's role in being a space mm -hmm. not necessarily even talking about like it as a brand just as a space a right. place that people that we allowed a lot of people to do certain things that maybe benefited them at the at the time because they needed that connection to a space to kind of grow what they were doing. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Whether it being Chance first doing his 10-day listening party mm -hmm. 
at there, you know, to us, even at the Wicker Park store, when Vic Mensa, we used to do this like little open mic thing with my homies that are producers, Nez and Rio, where they would come to the store and make beats live. We had cats come and do music, mm -hmm. like, you know, and link up with them. So, you know, you have all these connections to just being a space that people from out of town knew and like G-Eazy. Mm -hmm. Like I threw his first ever show in Chicago at Leaders Downtown. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I didn't even know he was from Oakland because he was in school in New Orleans. He went to like Tulane or something like that. But it's just being a space that people could connect with the culture and what was actually going on in Chicago. Yeah. And do you think that y'all were also like one of the first exporters in that way? Because you're saying like someone's coming through on tour, they've heard of the store or they're, they're just coming to yeah. Chicago. And there weren't that many other, whether it's physical spaces or brands or websites that people, you know, it was kind of like y'all and Fake Shore. And yeah, it was just kind of a thing that allowed people to connect like mm -hmm. Wale. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, all these artists, like you said, we released hats. So we started doing this thing where we just named hats after rappers when they was in town, released the hat. We become like a thing. It was just kind of like, like a cultural expansion to mm -hmm. kind of give something like a little story that can travel. Mm -hmm. And I think that those are like all things that help the culture grow because yeah. it gave people a space. And then it also taught people how to interact with other spaces in other cities. Mm -hmm. You know, it kind of developed that cultural um, explosion a little bit. Like, yeah. yeah. You know, the importance of space is like a big theme just in life that we we're figuring out, but definitely we try to talk about on the show. So I'm interested because there was so much clout surrounding it, right. That like, and there was so much like material, like, you know, you talking about, nice jeans and and you know hats that are cost more than your regular hat right so, right. so that attracts um insincerity sometimes yeah. right so how how did you how do you see community and like true relationships being formed and being maintained and were there like difficult lessons in that were there a lot of vultures and like how, how do you protect the true like human connection that's at the root of just maintaining space when there's so many bells and whistles. Well, I feel like, you know, even going. now is something that we still do to this point, like with Fat Tiger is we believe in organic relationship. So a relationship just can't happen because you said you want to have a relationship. Like, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> tip one. you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, it's like you get a girl's phone number and she texts you the next day is like, will you go with me? No, I want to get to know, know each, each other. other. We haven't hung out. Exactly. So it's the same thing with a store is I was more likely always to do something with somebody who I know pops by the shop, buys something, even if they can't buy everything, even if somebody that just kind of comes by, wants to see, comes to our events, supports things, just a person that's, oh, you want to do something. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. Whether then the person is just like somebody is like, oh man, this store hot. Yeah. You should get with them and try to do your thing. So how do you identify that? It's easy. You can see it. Mm -hmm. You know it. Like I'm around. It's not like I'm absentee. Yeah. <laughs> not like I'm not like you come to the store and I'm never there. Like I'm absentee. I know. I'm at the events. I know. I know if you come. Like I know. Mm -hmm. Like it's not like a mystery. It's not like, oh man, you I just be coming on the days you don't come there. But that means <laughs> well, somebody I was there Monday through Saturday and we're closed Sunday. So. Yeah. No, and that means that somebody else would have that relationship yeah, with yeah. you that's at mm -hmm. the store and they would be like, Oh yeah, this is a good idea. They mess with us. Right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of people, it's a very hard hard thing to fake is authenticity like you can't mm -hmm. fake authenticity mm -hmm. that's the big thing about what fat tiger is and i think why we do such a good job at being who we are is because it's authentic authentic what though i agree but i'm curious what like authentic what it's authentic chicago mm -hmm. and it's authentic streetwear mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying it's not a bunch of guys that came from outside the culture they got some rich investor to be like oh yeah you guys want to do something do it no we came from this came from us. We are people that are known from being in this scene, whether it's known from being at leaders to any, just our growth is documented. Mm -hmm. Like you can't, like if you l look into Vic Lloyd or Joe or Rello mm -hmm. or Dez, you're not going to be like, oh man, these guys popped up yesterday mm -hmm. in this world. Mm -hmm. You're going to see some lineage. There's a lineage. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? It's a starting point. And to your point about the cloud, like, quote streetwear of anything probably attracts more of that they just popped up out of nowhere than pretty much maybe maybe rappers maybe you'll get more pop-up rappers yeah but i feel like streetwear is a is a dangerous dangerous cesspool that yeah so so like that's another interesting relationship because i think i think you're right i think what makes y'all so effective is like y'all can just do a limited run of something that feels very true mm -hmm. to like chicago culture but how do you is it in like limited access and like not 
mass producing. I'm gonna ask the question: How do you find the the balance between the authentic of the the creation, but then the sometimes inauthenticity of the consumerism, right? Because like something that was like when it first struck me was like, oh man, on phone them hats was like that's like perfect, right? Like that had never been documented in any type of way. That right. was only through exactly. like speech. And then I got like friends from like out of town, like saying on four now, you know, like, like, yeah. like people don't With get it. R. And so, you know, you got, you know, like it's not necessarily explicitly racial, but like you got white kids trying to like, yeah, well, it's just the thing is you, because you also you connect those terminologies through how Chicago slang spreads through music. Mm -hmm. So true. That's like the biggest thing with that is, is like, you know, I think one thing that uh, I guess we try to do is capture moments. And the hat was a moment. It was kind of a thing that people started saying, and then people started seeing it on the internet and type. And then like how now the internet becomes a community, just mm -hmm. not Chicago wide, right, and right. not just States wide. It's kind of worldwide. Mm -hmm. So now people are starting to see this term and they heard a rapper use it. So now it's like a thing that's out there for the world, even though people have no idea what it means. Mm -hmm. So I think our thing is to kind of put stuff out there, at the right time, true. But also, you can respect it coming from yeah right. where we come. Because y'all from what? Right. So, what's the metrics of corny? Right. Like when when this when is is, the question? Yeah. Like like, like when do you see? Do when, like outside of just like that feeling in your gut, what type of like I don't know measures do you have? Of like ah, this might not be the time. Or like this one, is now too wide. Paul Ryan dabs is that the one? No, <laughs> it's just basically like this. It's like I always say that you have people that are early, mm -hmm. you have people that are on time, and then you have people that's late. So you can make good money. With the early people and the on time people. Now, if you want to get rich, you focus on the late people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's well, so excellent. I, I definitely thought you were going to go the other way, but that's true. No, you can get rich, but you're but, selling to the late people. But right? So, our whole thing is, is we worry about the early people and the on time people mm -hmm. and let somebody else worry about the late people. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? We're okay because we have enough ideas where we can keep it going. Mm -hmm. Right. You have the creativity other, to do also other be stuff. early and be on time. time. Yeah. It's not just responding to the early people. It's like we yeah. are so the early people. The, 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 the on time people are usually the people that try to do it and sell it to the late people. That's just usually how it goes. <laughs> you know, What's an example? This sounds this sounds like a a flip of like the five percent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you got like eighty five percent on time. What, what would be an example of something that is currently late that you were looking at when it was earlier on time? Dang, what's a thing that's like people are so? Because I I know it in music, but I'm thinking about it. In so it's like it's kind of hard with clothing now. Because stuff just lives in weird spaces. So things that are like late still will be a huge thing still. Mm -hmm. And not like you're not corny for messing with it. You're just like, oh, man, this is like, you know, it's kind of on the end of it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Something that's very, very the prime example of what's on time right now yeah. is tie-dye. Tie-dye is on time. Mm -hmm. We were probably very, very early yeah, yeah. on tie-dye. Mm -hmm. But tie-dye like is very, very, yeah. yeah. But tie-dye is probably very on time. It's not late. It's not mm -hmm. late yet. You know, it's probably going to take a while for it to be late. Mm -hmm. It's just on time because it's just a thing that's probably going to work in the summers. And you go back to the 70s. They were so early. They're late <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're so early, they're but the cycle, the cycle is like yeah. might have been 20 years before. The cycle is like 10 years now. It might even be five years yeah. now with something going out of style and coming back in style so think, quick. I'm trying to think about how to take that framework and put it to organizing stuff in terms of like late uh, being commodified, late being co-opted, late like. It, it still has resonance, but it doesn't have the like potential that it had before. Yeah. I mean, I think shutting down traffic. Yeah, that's you know, late. like when you see when you <laughs> see perfect. the the flagger with the yeah, with the yeah. superintendent, like we're gonna shut down the highway permissively. Yeah. When like you know that was so a, now a, this is weird, thing. you know, because since you do organize, so that is a question I guess coming back to yes. you, we love questions. Is you see this is see I think like boycotting and all that stuff is now late. Mm -hmm. I think that it's late and it's non effective anymore as far as this. so i'm trying to figure out so what's the new way and what's the new thing that you can organize and now be effective this yeah. Is the whole yeah i think i think for me uh you know within my experience but also the things that i see that i i admire the most is is and it's very actually like contemporary is building space right okay so, so we we have our you know the less brief collective has our space the Sada's daughters has has a, a really uh great space that's like focused on washington park you know, I, I see like uh, Dream Defenders, you know, there's folks in Oakland, that's okay. Dream Defenders in Florida, there's folks in Oakland. And so uh, really trying to make sure that you have a hub and, and something where you can build consistently and be something that can regenerate 
okay. and be creative for folks to go out. Uh, because, yeah, and so the question of boycott is kind of historical. It's really because the, the civil rights movement is taught in such a narrow way uh, okay. that we think that that's all that works. So we get the Montgomery bus boycott, which is obviously one of the most important campaigns ever. But it was very specific in a very local place for a public entity, right? right. So people just think, oh, man, if we boycott, they're going to listen to us. But, like, no, that was a few thousand people that were able to sustain for 18 months, basically. Right. And, like, you're not going to shut down. And it was a public service. Right. You're not going to shut down all of commerce mm -hmm. by stop going to, like, every black person can stop going to Starbucks and Starbucks will be fine. Yeah. Right. And so, like focusing on that one thing because that's what we've been taught it would be good for common eye actually he would just get hired again <laughs> yeah. if, 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 if starbucks ever gets their shit together common's out of a good yeah game, you know? <laughs> yeah so so i think that's that's a good example of like okay if if you have a very local small entity that's dependent on you you can yeah. boycott them but now we live in you know uh transnational corporations exactly right so this this one market and you've been able to get 500 people that's not shopping somewhere yeah. is not going to have the same effect as as a big story would right See, or like so paint a narrative my thing is my idea now i don't know how to do this and this might <laughs> this might also be how you can help see me i want to do the opposite of a boycott mm -hmm. so instead of when something goes wrong let's stop saying okay we're going to stop doing this mm -hmm. let's just say oh man let's just go over here and do our thing yeah alternative like, building let's 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 uplift this business because right. my thing is about, I realized growing up, you know, I grew up in Inglewood. It wasn't a lot of opportunity. I was fortunate enough that, you know, I got to go to private school, but still around, there was no things mm -hmm. like, so my idea is always that I want to be able to be a person that can create jobs mm -hmm. and create things mm -hmm. that people can do that aren't traditional. You know, nobody grows up saying they want to be a bus driver, although a bus driver is a good job. Mm -hmm. But somebody might grow up say, I want to be a graphic designer. Right. But they also do not have that any idea creativity. how to do that, where to go get a job for that. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I, want, I would like to create more stuff like that. I would like our organizers to focus on more things that are trade-based mm -hmm. and not trade-based when I say putting carpet or tab, but trade-based into things that somebody can be interested in being able to go out and have a career in that they're interested in, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. It's an fostering creativity. It's yeah. an interesting challenge, right? Because so if so much of what you're challenging on the political side is the way that like jobs and labor and industries exploit people, right. Um, then how do you build part of what you're building then is not just like, here's a gateway into this industry where you're going to be exploited. It's how right. do you create some structure so that when you step into it, you have some tools behind you. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know? And the power dynamics. And that also like, too. How many, how many, what we're talking about promoters or clothing brands are exploitative to on so many levels. And, and y'all are a good example of how do you counteract that by having good relationships. But you know, that's a tricky thing to figure out. You don't want to welcome someone into a, well, a situation where they're going to be exploited. Also, everybody can be a business owner. And the thing that I tell people about owning a business is you get paid last. Like, yeah. you know, it's not it's not the glamorous life you think of. It's yeah. fun and cool because you get to do what you want to do. But there's no off day. Yeah. yeah, it's like, you know, I work. Like, you know, that's what I do. I work. Yeah. It just happened that I like and the work And there's a lot of failure involved. Well, there's a lot of... I, I, I'd like to not speak on failure. Failure is always a bad word. There's a lot of missteps. Okay. You know I mean, like saying? most businesses don't. Well, a lot of businesses last. fail. Yeah. <laughs> it's right. just a part of it. Yeah, it's just yeah. a thing of how, how, how it goes. You just got to have the stomach for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's go. Let's go back, though, because you, you mentioned briefly growing up and, and having the, the private school. Yeah, where'd you go to high school? Home. Yeah. Where'd you go to school? Uh, I went to St. Rita. So oh, okay. I went, yeah, Catholic wow, wow. League. Yeah. Let's, uh, what was 16 year old Vic imagining he was going to be doing at this point in his life? Shoo, 16 year old Vic really honestly had no idea mm -hmm. about anything that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Like I was naturally good at school. It wasn't like I was like a hard worker. I tested well. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, I played sports. What'd you play? Um, I played basketball and baseball. Okay. Yeah. Well, St. Rita's a basketball school. So now they are. When uh, I went, we were not. Oh, we you were, you were at a low point. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then actually I got in a car accident when I was in high school. And like, so I couldn't play basketball like my junior and senior year, mm. but I like got healthy enough like uh to play my uh senior year baseball mm -hmm. uh yeah Wait, so there was, there was no like external goal of like here's where I want to be no nah, man I kind of always like I just kind of was just I just kind of went with the flow like I went to college I went to Loyola mm -hmm. and there I guess I picked up like I, I I thought I was like at that point I was like man 
I like talking to people, so maybe I'll get into politics. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm charming. I can win mm -hmm. some people over. Maybe mm -hmm. I'll get into the political sphere. So I tried, to de tried that in school, but it really wasn't like a goal. Like I was kind of like, whatever. Yeah. It just kind of happened. I slipped and fell into what I'm doing now, yeah. and this made the most sense. This was always what I was supposed to be doing. So you're saying back then you kind of had that interest on the political end, and now you're talking about trying to figure out how to how to marry the two. Are there ways that throughout the years in the different like um, spaces that you've made that whether you know because y'all don't make like explicitly like political shirt, you know those are so they though that's a corny adjacent to corny move. But how have y'all tried to inform what you do? politically or well, is there a frame? I also there? just think that our thing is being a good example. Mm. You know, you know, we're a bunch of, you know, black men from the city of Chicago, you know, two from the West side, two from the South side that just want to be positive examples of that. You can come from these places and do positive mm -hmm. things. That's what, that's what I'm trying to show. Cause yeah. I think that's a good example. Whether me putting, um, you know, F 12 on a shirt, like, you know, cool. Like, you know, whatever, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm very indifferent when it comes to like the police thing, because me growing up, I never thought of the police as a thing that helped. Mm -hmm. So I never like I grew up in a way that I never if something happened, it was never my idea to be like, oh, man, I'm a car. Only thing I call the police for is if you get in a car accident, right. I need a police report, right. you know, for some legal things. It's not like oh, there's man, a problem happening outside. Let yeah. Me, let me call the police to come like, fix it. Local, <laughs> yeah. It's like not even no thing. So to me, it's all those things. It's like it's just a lot of flawed systems. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, and a lot of things. And like, I don't want to become another like people st like standing on something to say and like oh man let's just drive this thing to the ground mm -hmm. i feel like there's enough people that handle those issues what i want to be is in a supporting role yeah. of being able to do positive things for our community in and any build way an alternative you know yeah. a space that any way that i can yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah man that's crazy i i just realized even as somebody who like the police thing is my thing right and like talk about police <laughs> abolition yeah. i didn't realize it was probably like within the last nine months to a year i was like damn i never have even thought to call the police. Like, it, yeah. without insurance being, like, I've had my house broken into, so, like, you gotta, you, you gotta you, get a police report. Get, that's really without insurance being involved, Never that's been. not gonna even be an option for me. So that shit is crazy. <laughs> but, um, spe speaking of being an example, I think, you know, one thing to, to really highlight and big you up for is, you know, you, we were talking before, you said you've been focused on getting healthy, and it's like, it's visible. I yeah. saw you at Nico's joint at the Adidas store, and that might have been the first time I saw you. Yeah, I don't know exactly. how long. Yeah. It was like, whoa, like, yeah. man, like, love like yeah. so so talk about that journey and um my journey was is that i needed you know i was getting older i was unhealthy you know and i just kind of decided it, this was the time for me to get healthy it's like all what was the first do, step the first step was diet really honestly i went on a very strict diet for four months you know basically consisted of me basically eating very similar things mm -hmm. every day what you were, know what were you eating what were you not eating so for like so basically i cut out sugar Fried food. That's the key. The sugar is the key. I've yeah. been saying it. It's all about the <laughs> white sugar. bread, white rice. Yeah. Um, I had stopped drinking for that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so basically, simple carbs. Basically, yeah, basically cut, cutting all that stuff out. So like that. That was the first stage of it. So really, every day I would eat like, um, like a whole grain cereal and almond milk, unsweetened, for breakfast. I eat a sal. I ate a salad every day for lunch for four months. I eat a salad every day for lunch. And then for dinner, I have like some type of, sorry, some type of grilled chicken, yeah. fish, rice, vegetable, brown mm -hmm. rice. I should yeah. say brown rice or quinoa, very healthy alternatives. And I drink nothing but water. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like gallon and a half of water a day. And then I got into like, I just, I always rode a bike and I just got more into it. Mm -hmm. So I just started doing that as my exercise. And I always played basketball. So riding a bike and basketball became like my exercise. I tried to, so on a week, I would ride from my crib to the store on a bike. That's like 16 to 18 miles a day. Oh, man. 16 to 18 miles a day. Do that three times a week. Yeah, and I play good. basketball on Sunday for like two hours. So the that diet, would be my workout. The diet, thing is the so diet cuts, would, cuts the weight. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? The you, can, exercise, you can run and bike as much as you want. And it'll get you in bed. Your cardio will be better, all that stuff. But if you're eating sugar. Yeah. So now I cheat. Like I do yeah. a lot of Shout probably, out to the food cheaters. I'm like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Unhealthy things. But now I, I understand the balance. It's a balance. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get yeah, the yeah. balance. So yeah. like, oh man, I want to get crazy. It much control. Yeah. Of you. yeah. Yeah. So why were you like, this is the time I need to get healthy? Um, I didn't want to, I don't want to die. <laughs> That's a very That's, good reason. Yeah. Yes. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, Perfect you know, <laughs> a lot of 
you know, a lot of uh, heart disease, a lot of high blood pressure, a lot of diabetes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's just a lot of things. It's like, oh, man, if I want to escape these things, let me get on this now because mm. it's so much harder yeah. later. Did you already feel it getting harder? Because I'm already feeling my metabolism slowing down and all that. And as crazy as my metabolism is crazy high again. Because you cut the sugar out? Because it's just like in the activity. Yeah. It's like, it's like stupid. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's crazy high. Are there things that, whether it's energy or any like lessons learned from the getting in shape that have helped or have taught you a new for like the next challenges you're taking on? Like no, something you're to take from that process. Just discipline yeah. and understanding. But like, I have a very non addictive personality, so I can quit anything. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't hard. Really, with me, it was just deciding I was going to do it. Could mm -hmm. you quit work? No. Uh, there's one exception <laughs> yeah no 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 i like i like i love what i do too much mm -hmm. and i feel like i have so much more to accomplish mm -hmm. are there like big as we move toward the end of the hour are there like big pie in the sky goals that maybe aren't going to happen this year or next year but you're like in 10 years 20 years i want this to exist in the world well yeah so one thing that i'm working on is with my brand is i'm going to probably go like you know maybe start doing like a international wholesale like i want to have my brand all over the world mm -hmm. like i want to get into that space of putting the brand all over the world so yeah. that's a goal you love flights yeah. to japan you know yeah <laughs> so seems like everyone went to japan this week by it was way. a real chicago this trip a real chicago, chicago, chicago trip japan, yeah. yeah then um just personally yeah. you know i'm i'm going to probably buy a home that's a good goal i want to buy a home yeah want to have a place that's a, like a forever place yeah um, in the city for sure yeah for sure yeah. um do you know people who are buying homes i feel like i'm right on the brink not, of like not, weddings not not homes. not a lot in chicago mm -hmm. cuz chicago is a, is a difficult place to buy a home in talk about making space Come because on. people don't want to get out of their comfort zone see me i don't mind i'll you know i'll live a little further south or a little mm -hmm. out west it mm -hmm. don't bother me so i can get a home that's like affordable when i get all the space i want yeah. Yeah. you know what i'm saying but you know some people like we're addicted to being like close to things yeah. i'm not i like commutes like, commutes <laughs> don't bother me i like to feel like i'm going to work if i live closer to the store i would never feel like i was off yeah. So, so yeah go ahead. so like that that draw of downtown and how people like magnetize to that space what what are some other like big lessons i think you're somebody who has been central but also has been able to move around and see other cities and other mm -hmm you know, wings of the culture. What are some things that have been unique in how Chicago is operating and built? From well, I've saw Chicago in two different places. Like uh, growing in this scene, like in the beginning, Chicago was a very, very divided place. It was really, really hard to get people to, really, really hard to get people to work together. It's really, really hard to develop community. And now it's so crazy is that Chicago so together. There's such a community there's so many things that everybody kind of supports everybody's thing. And like that, like haterville mentality that I grew up in starting to be a creative kind of died. Mm -hmm. Like, and like, like, it's more so like love, Chicago is like love land. People, yeah. you know, <laughs> Chicago really, really is for lovers. Yeah. Chicago is, <laughs> for lovers, yeah. <laughs> Chicago is definitely for lovers. Yeah. That's so, a t-shirt right there. I it, guess. Is, it is a t-shirt. Yeah. We oh, made yeah, that yeah, t-shirt yeah, two years yeah, ago. Yeah. That was one of my, I, it was like, man, I held on to like my 20 tier wardrobe for like a long time. For like a long, <laughs> that was we'll like one of my favorite shirts. You brought it to Iowa and yeah. there it was right on time. <laughs> but it was crazy. I actually, uh, the, you know, like the like the Carter's tours now, but like I went to the I forgot what it was called, but when Jay and Justin Timberlake were at Soldier Field. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know if you were there or if you heard or anybody told y'all, but like Justin Timberlake shouted out the shirt. He said oh, okay. he said, Man, I was I was in the airport today. I saw somebody with Chicago's for Lovers shirt. I bought it off of him. He's like, I'm just playing, but I was tripping because I got that shirt. That's yeah. it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Should have been at the airport. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's about that time. I think we is it, go is it time? Here. Okay. Time. All right. So we we've 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 gone through some of the history of the city, man. We, okay. we we've gone into your personal story. Um, you know, we we've bonded. I think we've connected. But now it it is time to get to the center of our work. This this last part of the show, this game we're about to play with you that we're putting you on the spot for. Okay. It, it is what it is what we do. So we're talking about love, uh, but we're also all, all about accountability here at Ergo Radio. Okay. And the tool we use for accountability is beef. And so okay. there has been a sect of the world in my 25 years that I think has run amok. <laughs> and we at Ergo Radio, we are the ones doing the work. We will have no more of it. And that group is R&B singers. <laughs> so every week we invite our guests 
to start <laughs> beef with the R&B singer from any era. So from Motown on down, from David Ruffin to whatever SoundCloud singer is out yesterday, beef with an R&B singer and why? Oh, dang, man, that's crazy. You on the spot. I know it's tough, but it's real work. Maybe I'll beef with Trey Songs. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Maybe I'll beef with Trey Songs. <laughs> I don't know. He does a little bit too much. Yeah. He's very, very light skinned. And I'm light skinned. Like, he's too light skinned. Like, it, it, he does like, a lot of light skinned things. Yeah. The eye squint, the licking the lips. It's like too much light skin stuff. On. Yeah, put your shirt back on, man. We're hanging out all the guys. Right? <laughs> put your shirt back on. I really don't need you out here topless. You know it's what I'm saying? Warm. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's you're not in Chicago. It's not always a Vegas yeah. pool party. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's like, you know, just make your music. Um, you know. And do your thing, like make your music and and and, and beat it. Where? Do you think you would be as offended that he was shirtless if you didn't make shirts? <laughs> probably, I would. I would probably. He's be like, the hey, bottom man, line, man. <laughs> make a hey, man, come buy a shirt. I do, yeah, like I do make shirts. Like, you know, like get a shirt. Just walking around sockless, you're like that's fine. Yeah, man, you should. We you should make a some shirt like a put a shirt on a shirt and send it. To- <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I used to be a huge fan. What's crazy is when I was out of shape, I always had my shirt off. I'm in shape, and I always keep my shirt on. Oh, Maybe it's just the backwards thing, yeah. like you know. Me is like I'm not trying like to. You can't tell me anything. Yeah, it was real. It was real Rossy in the way you. Yeah, you I was do. very, very Rick Ross. Yeah, very <laughs> Ross. Rossy. Yeah. Mm. So I know I have recently discovered for those who are are fans of this particular subgenre, uh, there is a playlist called Rick Ross Soulful Essentials. Okay, I've been a long time fan of Rick Ross over like a soul sample beat. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of hip hop's that be- like that's an amazing. Oh, thing. I thought it was like him. With, enough, I thought it was him with like dress. soul singers. That's oh, what I thought it was. That would be cool because he has a you know. Um, Window seat, him and Erica Badu is an amazing mm-hmm. him with a yeah, that's a really, that as the yeah, that's a really, really good remix. Right. Window seat, that's just Erica a, Badu. a shameless not plug for us, but just yeah. a PSA. That's a good I'm, I'm gonna throw in a, a, a extra uh R&B beef, and I, I have a sense that y'all probably are cool, so I'm I, I say this okay hesitantly, but man, Jeremiah really took an L right now with, with this whole Tia the Taylor thing. That did not look good. I really, really want to be on Jeremiah's team, like, I want to. I, I feel like I'm the thing missing that maybe I should be Jeremiah's DJ. I'm the thing <laughs> missing so he doesn't have these issues. Yeah. Did, you, did you hear what happened? With the, the Tiana Taylor. Yeah. Pulled up the tour. Man, to, to, to be called a diva by a diva who's <laughs> opening up for you and then her leave the tour and then you but, get kicked off your old but tour. This is the that's, big, the tour. that's a but big This era. is the biggest thing with Jeremiah is because Jeremiah has more commercial success than everybody else on that tour like yeah. together. Oh. Like his commercial success is huge. Yeah. He's a huge artist commercially. I think somehow that just doesn't translate to people till they go to his show. Right. You go to a Jeremiah show, you're like, like, man, oh, man, Jeremiah got yeah, here yeah. for days. No, he's extremely talented. Yeah. But there's, you I'm feel very, like- very excited about his I- album with Ty Dolla Sign. Word. Because I'm a huge Ty Dolla Sign fan. Word. Like, it seems it's probably like unhealthy. That's. <laughs> Like you know what I'm saying? How what is it? What is it about Ty Dolla? I agree. I think he was I'm very never, friendly to me at Chance's I'm never grandma party. Mad when there's a Ty Dolla Sign feature on a song, well, because Ty Dolla Sign actually like his like his Beach House series was like songs mm-hmm. about my life at the time because I was <laughs> single. You know what I'm saying? Like you know what I'm saying? I just he made a lot of records that kind of spoke to me, like you know being a chick's other one, man, like all type of crazy <laughs> Ty Dolla Sign stuff. You know. <laughs> You had a little yeah. little situation going on. Oh, it, was weird. it was weird. But, you know, I would, you know, this is like when we like, you know, first was at Fat Tiger. So it was right. like a lot of time has passed. Things have changed. Right. So I want to ask one more question. Because I feel, you know, we went through all this, but I just feel like you have so many stories and so many like little moments. Yes. Are there any moments where there was someone who you're like, oh, they're about to be the next person coming out of Chicago. And then they did one thing that ruined it for them. Mm, that's tough. Um, so or a couple things. Well, uh, no, I, 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 I came in real hot with that. <laughs> no, nah, because I really, really, really don't know. Like, cause a lot of people have done really, really well. I think it's a like a couple people that maybe I think Chance has shown a lot of people that you can do it independent. It's a couple people that I thought should have took record deals. Mm-hmm. Might have worked out a little bit better that's for mm-hmm. for they you know, like you know career. It's like what works for one person doesn't. That, yeah, like, mm-hmm. you know, just because like you know. But I think that from Chicago, like the probably the biggest example of that is maybe Chief Keith, mm-hmm. because I threw Chief Keith's like first show in New York mm-hmm. at SOBs. And actually we had booked the show at like months ahead of time, but that's the day we had the show. He signed the day before mm-hmm. his record deal. And 
he did like a hundred things that you probably shouldn't do. <laughs> yeah. To Especially for how culturally impactful yeah. he was. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah, he's very, very influential. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's a topic for another day is that that's a profile that someone needs yeah. to, to do in a not crappy way is like the significant. And he's still like, very he made it through. Yeah. Like he's, very he's still around. Yeah. He's still doing his thing. Anyway. Right. Well, we appreciate you, man. This, this was definitely love. Uh, any plugs? You know, you want to do the socials? Any, any where can people find you? We already got North Coast and Vicar Fest coming up. Yes. But uh, where, where, where can people follow you? Follow me at Vic Lloyd. That's V I C L L O Y D. Double L. Double L V I C L L O Y D. The only double L I acknowledge is Lloyd. <laughs> I, have a, I have a long standing beef with LL Cool J. Okay. So. Yeah. That's another story. <laughs> But you can follow me on anything at Vic Lloyd. Uh, very simple. I got a lot of stuff coming up, so definitely follow me on the Insta and the Twitter. And just come through the store. Come through the store at Fat Tiger Workshop, and that's at Fat Tiger Works on all social. What's the address? 836 North Milwaukee, Chicago, Illinois. And come see us. Always something beautiful happening out of there. We're at Ergo Radio. I'm at Ergo Kiss. I'm Damon underscore AF. Subscribe, follow, review, pay us some money. We take donations. We'll happily take a donation. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we'll be back next week showcasing and celebrating Chicago. Much love to the people. Peace. You know I love this one. Hey. Yeah. Uh. Hey. Yeah. Uh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Let me explain it. Oh. Shit kind of foul while I'm sitting in the aisle. People taking pictures of me like I'm going out of style. MacBook, Dre beat, Southern playlistic. Half a joint that I clip smelt like the whole zipper. Anyhow, I begin to yawn. The human bong kick my clogs off and recline just like a dawn. Yo, what up? This episode is sponsored by Backblaze Online Backup. It's a simple way to back up all your movies, yeah. photos, videos, music, and all your other data. That's right, data. Ooh. For just five dollars a month. It's simple, and you can access all your data. Data. That's right. Data Ooh. online from wherever you are. I like the way you say data. Try it absolutely free by going to backblaze.com slash C P C. Mm. Mm.